The ocean covers 70% of the globe. It gives us oxygen and food and millions of jobs. It brings joy and shapes our climate and weather. The ocean is life and it belongs to everyone. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is the world's independent leader in ocean discovery, exploration, and education, working to understand and sustain one of humanity's most precious common resources. Join us today for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Welcome to Ocean Encounters from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, as we like to call it for short. My name is Veronique LaCapra, and I'll be your host for this evening. HUI's Ocean Encounters presentations are made possible in part by the generous support of the Avatar Alliance Foundation and Dalio Philanthropies. Thank you. Our fourth season of Ocean Encounters has been named an endorsed activity of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And now a special message from HUI's president and director, Peter Domenico. Welcome to tonight's special Ocean Encounters event, Giving Reefs a Chance, How Science and Technology Can Help Corals in Crisis. I am HUI President and Director, Peter Domenical, and happy World Ocean Day, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person tonight, but I wanted to thank you for being part of our community. Your support for HUI's mission helps us advance ocean science, engineering, and education, and helps us raise awareness of the importance of the ocean to all of us. I know many of you are watching tonight are HUI members, so thank you for that. Your contributions are vital to the work we do for the ocean, our planet, and our future. World Ocean Day is a time to reflect on the role of the ocean in our lives. The ocean is our planet's life support system and one of the most critical resources. But like other parts of the planet, it is feeling the impacts of climate change, pollution, and other stressors. Despite these challenges, our ocean has the potential to be a source of hope for, and solutions for some of humanity's most pressing problems from global climate change to food and energy security. Hui is at the forefront of ocean research and innovation, and we're looking for new ways to help ocean ecosystems at risk. World Ocean Day is also Hui's day of giving. I'd like to thank a group of corporation members for making this year's amazing $100,000 triple match challenge possible. If you haven't already, there's still some time to meet this match by going to hui.edu slash give. You are not only supporting critical ocean research, you also get to be part of an incredible community here at HUI. And now on to the show. Tonight you'll hear about how ocean, uh, HUI scientists, engineers, and students are working to help corals in crisis and give reefs the chance they deserve. Coming to you live from Woods Hole, take it away, Veronique. Thank you, Peter, and happy World Ocean Day to you. Tonight's a little different from our usual Ocean Encounters events. We have both an online audience and an audience here with us in Woods Hole, which is really fantastic. At various points in tonight's presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, if you're here in the room, you can just raise your hand and one of my colleagues will bring you a microphone. If you're joining us on Zoom and you'd like to take part in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A function on your Zoom window and type your question in the little pop-up box that will appear. If um, you might be more used to using the chat function in Zoom, but please for tonight use the Q&A function instead. We often get hundreds of questions, so I apologize in advance if we don't get to yours while we're live. You can, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can ask questions anytime starting now. I also want to let you know that we are recording this event and that recording will be made available on the hui.edu website. We had 1300 people uh, registered to join us on Zoom tonight, so you are all in very good company. We also have viewers joining us right now on Facebook and on YouTube. So if you're here in Woods Hole or online, thank you and welcome. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about the coral reef crisis and what HUI is doing to help solve it. When I call it a crisis, that's not an exaggeration. We've already lost about half of the world's coral reefs. Here in the US, coral reefs are also being hit hard. 
For our online audience, we have a poll, um, and that poll is about Florida's coral reef. The question is, how much of Florida's original coral reef cover is still alive and healthy today? How much of Florida's original coral reefs are still alive today? Um, I'd like to have the in-person audience participate in this too while we have our online voting going on. So just by a show of hands, um, do you think it's A, 2%, B, 50%, or C, 65%? Okay, we have some optimists in the room. That's nice to hear. <laughs> um, all right, uh, my colleague Ken Costell is tracking the online responses. Ken, how did our online audience vote? Awesome, all right, <laughs> terrific. Um, I'm not sure your mic's on either, Ken. You have to touch the bottom. Yeah, I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> Second technical, Second technical glitch. Um, so the, um, the, the, the choices that we had on Zoom were 2%, 10%, 50%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%, 65%
And then lastly, we work with engineers um, here at HUI to develop sensors and sensing technologies for being able to go out within the field and measure these signatures of chemical stress. One of those being disco that we saw out in the lobby if you're That's here right. in the room with us tonight. Um, Yogi, tell us about yourself. Mm, hi. Uh, so I uh, am the, I run the HUI's Autonomous Robotics and Perception Lab, so also known as Warp Lab at HUI. So we are, our lab is interested in looking at like how can we build better ocean exploration robots through the use of uh, machine learning, AI, and robotics, right? So, and, and in more specifically recently, you know, I've been more and more interested in coral reefs and trying to figure out how to be built robots which can operate in coral reef -like environments, um, and which has been, which is uh, useful not only from the point of view of like coral reefs are in trouble and we need to save them, but also as a more selfish reason of being a computer scientist and looking at the problem from like that point of view. It's a very complicated and interesting world. Like the coral reef ecosystems, uh, as Veronique earlier said, are one of the most uh, diverse ecosystems on the planet, which from the computer scientists, when, he, uh, when they hear that, that means, you know, there are lots of variables, uh, lots of, uh, categories of observations, lots of interactions, lot very complicated dynamics, and you know, I think it's a great place to do uh, robotics research and I think make a difference. So uh, my lab is looking at, has been looking at ways to build better robots which can not only just, we don't want to just record data, we want to like uh, have robots which can understand the coral reef ecosystem and like, uh, and, uh, uh, and focus, figure out where they should pay attention to and identify things early on. So, yeah. All right, thanks Yogi. Colleen, I wanna come back to you for a minute. Um, earlier, I shared some pretty discouraging statistics about coral reefs and how they're struggling to survive, but how do we actually know that? How is the health of coral reefs tracked? Yeah, so typically, and what's been done for uh, a long time, um, and what we still use today is we, we we assess the health of a, of a reef ecosystem visually. So how does it look? And so this is an example of you know, a, a, an ecosystem that obviously is in, in stress. And so this is based on um, looking for symptoms. Is, is the coral reef showing signs of stress? Are there lesions like you would see uh, from disease? Is it turning white like you're seeing here? When a coral turns white, that's a symptom of a, of a dysfunction of the coral itself. It's lost these essential mm -hmm. algae and, and microbes that live within the coral tissue. And oh, because algae is really a symbiosis, right? It's, it's both an animal and a little plant, it's not really a plant, but a plant-like algae inside it. Yeah, the, the, yeah so this, there's a symbiotic relationship between the coral and the algae, right? right? And the algae are what give it that beautiful color, right? The, that you see when you see a healthy coral. And when they turn white, it means that the algae is no longer there. The algae has been lost from the coral. And so that, that algae is not only giving it color, it's providing it nutrients. And so this is an essential symbiosis in what keeps corals happy and healthy and functioning. And so you, you look at a coral that's turning white, you know that it's starving. So it's, it's not being able to acquire the essential nutrients that it needs. And so it's on its way to death. And so the way that we typically look at you know, assessing health is you, you have a diver in the water, you're taking photographs, uh, you're taking surveys of the corals themselves. Are they looking white? Are they showing lesions? And you're also looking at the ecosystem as a whole. Is it becoming more algal dominated? Are we losing our fish diversity? And so, but these are all visual symptoms. Yeah, so that doesn't sound very high tech to me. I mean, I could practically go out, go out there and do that myself, right? <laughs> so, um, but, uh, so, I mean, it would be like if I went to the doctor, right, and I was feeling really sick, but all the doctor did, and they didn't run scans, they didn't, you know, take my blood and get it tested, they just looked at me and decided what I had based on basically my physical symptoms. Is that kind of where we're at with coral reefs and judging their health? Yeah. Close to that, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. And so it's imagine going to the doctor and they're just waiting for you to look sick, 
rather than <laughs> take, you know, which sometimes you do. But um, yeah. you know, so instead of taking your blood to look like to look whether or not your white blood cell count is high, or mm. or looking at your urine to see whether or not there's high levels of glucose indi indicating that your pancreas isn't functioning properly, or taking your cholesterol. So all these things that you know you, you don't visually look sick, mm. um, but you have to really start taking the pulse um, of of us as well as we need to take the pulse of the reef. So what would more preventative healthcare, if I can use that terminology, look like for a coral reef? What would we want to be able to do? Yeah, so it's very similar to how healthcare um, has shifted from being reactive, waiting for symptoms to manifest. You know, we're, we're moving towards more proactive, more preventative care. And we need to do the same thing for coral reefs. We need to be able to um, have early signs that the corals are undergoing stress, that there's a, um, um, a dysfunction of the health, of a dysfunction of that symbiotic relationship, for instance. And so some of those ways, the ways that we can do that are looking for signatures of stress. And so one of the things that, that my group is doing are, are studying uh, chemicals that are indicators of health and, and also stress. And so one of these, uh, some of you here tonight have already heard me talking about this is reactive oxygen species. So our immune system is not that much different than a coral. And so when you get stressed, when you get exposed to a pathogen, for instance, your immune system kicks in. And one of your first lines of defense is to produce chemicals. And it's like a chemical warfare, right? You're producing these very reactive compounds that can ward off this pathogen. And corals do the same thing, which is really interesting, right? So we have, you know, the same kind of a cellular response to a stress. And so what we're trying to, to figure out is, you know, can we actually measure this chemical in coral reefs and detect it before the coral looks stressed? And is it, can we detect that the immune system is being kicked into high gear? So what that would tell us that there's some sort of stress, whether or not that's a pathogen, or coastal pollution or something that's stressing the coral. And so what you're seeing on the screen right now with the video is DISCO, which some of you saw here tonight, which is the, the instrument that we developed to be able to measure um, the, this, these um, reactive oxygen species that are produced um, in response to a stress. So this is an example of how you know, we can start looking for early warning signs, early warning signs of stress before symptoms are, are showing up. Yogi, what other kinds of technology are you developing to assess the health of coral reefs? Yeah, so, so, the, so Colleen gave the, the visiting a doctor metaphor, but I think another way we can sort of, another metaphor might be if you're looking at the whole coral reef, you know, uh, then like there's also the public health metaphor, right? So for example, if, if all of a sudden you, you saw, you know, the public transportation, there's really not that much traffic happening going somewhere or like, you know, all of a sudden there are a lot more ambulances going around in a city, you know, there's something going on, right? So, and I think really what we need is, um, up till now we have been using robots are, uh, we've been using robots underwater for a long time, but basically they've been used for just like taking a, carrying a sensor, collecting data, come back, we analyze it, but that is not, so enough for understanding something as complicated as a coral reef because, because there are too many things happening, it's too dynamic, it's changing with space, time, and it's a very complicated ecosystem. So, so what we really need is to build these robots which can sort of be in the coral reef, they can understand, for example, you know, hey, I, I, I at this location, this type of habitat, I know the biodiversity, here's my robot sort of, one of the techniques we are working on is to automatically understand different types of habitats. So this is one of our robot. We are re-rendering the results and showing it automatically recognizing the different types of habitats. Um, uh, and once you have that understanding, then you can, when you see a fish, you can say, hey, normally I see this fish in this type of habitat, but you know, a storm has passed through and all those things, now I'm actually seeing this fish displaced and all of a sudden I, I'm not seeing that fish or I'm seeing different types of fish in this habitat, that's an anomaly, there's something has happened. Or an, another uh, thing might be, although uh, up till now we've been using divers to visually look at the coral reef in a very simplistic way, but, uh, but you can use the visual information many other ways. For example, if you could you know, track some 
uh, some keystone animals on a, on, a, on a reef, right? So animals, you can use them as sensors. If you can model their behavior, if you can follow them all day and or you know how they behave, how they interact with other animals, and you say the, see the, if you are able to detect the changes in the behavior, you're actually relying on these extremely complicated sensors. There's no way we can build sensors as good as what a, a fish might be having on their own, like they are the best sensor. So, but we are detecting, you know, using them as a, a, another proxy to kind of sense what's happening in the reef. And so, but we, uh, so we, in our lab, we're looking at some of the techniques. We can make these smarter robots, which can sort of really get into the reef and, you know, be, understand, be part of the reef and understand what's happening and detect anomalies early on, which we hope if we do it the right way, then these anomalies would uh, enable us to potentially uh, identify problems early on and we can act early on. Could we just run that video again of the robot uh, swimming through the water if we can? I just yeah, want, for so, the benefit of the online audience, what's going on here? Yeah. Uh, no, sorry, the one you had a second ago. That one. Yeah, so this is a, the robot we are developing in our lab uh, and uh, it's, it's very different from most of the other robots which exist at Hui and other places. It's got lots of, uh, it's got cameras and it's got hydrophones uh, on it, so it can sense, it can see and sense, it's got a lot of computing power, so it can actually, in real time, it can process all that data and, and try to uh, understand the broader context. So it's like that, so in this example, it's modeling uh, the different types of habitat it's encountered, like the different colored dots here corresponds to different types of, you know, it'll color like a healthy coral with a different color uh, uh, and a sandy patch with a different color, and you don't have to train it. So the cool thing about this, some of these technologies we are working on is every reef is different. So there are so many different locations on the ocean. If we depend on trained data, we'll, it'll take a long time. So we have been looking at techniques where the robot can just learn by itself from the environment. And uh, so that's Very an cool. example of that technique. All right. I want to pause for a second and see if we have any questions either from our audience here in the room or uh, Ken, are there any questions online? Yeah. Um... A couple of people have been asking, what are the effects of plastics? And I would say both macro and microplastics. Are we seeing any impacts wide scale? So what are the effects of plastics on coral reefs? Do you feel comfortable taking that, Colleen? Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if there's a, a whole lot of research being done in that yet. I know that there has been some, some research looking into microplastics. So, you know, what happens when a polyp actually tries to eat a, a piece of, of microplastic um, and whether or not that's detrimental or not to the coral. And I honestly don't know whether or not that's actually a toxic effect or not, or whether or not the coral can, can get rid of the plastic. I don't know if Yogi, if you've yeah, heard anything. <laughs> yeah, but... Maybe a little outside of our outside. realm of knowledge here. <laughs> um, anything else online, Ken, that you want to share? Sure. Um... Ron is asking specifically, what nutrients do the algae provide? Don't the polyps attain, obtain their food by filtering plankton from the water? Yeah, so there's a lot of exchange. Uh, so uh, vitamins is one example. So they're exchanging nutrients back and forth. So some of the algae are producing organic carbon that's being fed directly because they're, you know, they're photosynthesizing, right? So they're producing organic carbon and feeding it to the coral. Um, and Which then the is coral, why corals need light. It's not that the polyp needs light per se, it's that the algae inside it needs that exactly, light. Exactly, right? right, exactly. And the, and the corals can also eat some of the particulate organic carbon from, from the water, um, but they're receiving a lot of other nutrients, you know, broken down amino acids and, and other nutrients, um, nitrogen, phosphorus from, from those algae. All right. So we've been talking about new ways to figure out that reefs might be in trouble more quickly, but presumably the reason we want to do that is that we, so that we can also intervene more quickly, right, and help a reef before it's too late, before it's already dead. Um, before we get into some of the new approaches that the Reef Solutions Initiative is developing, um, what's being done now to try and restore degraded reefs? reefs that might have been affected either by climate change, marine heat waves, or by disease or something like that. Sure, I can, you want me to take yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So uh, one of the, the common strategies, and that's, that's growing a lot of popularity right now, is to, to grow you know, small baby corals in the lab. 
either in the lab or you can actually grow them in little nurseries in the water. And this is an example of some, you know, small corals that are um, being placed out of within within the waters to to get them to grow to to get to a size where then we can transplant them onto a degraded reef. And so you have these baby corals that are grown, to, you know, to to a size where they should be able to survive. Plant out, plant them onto the reef. The idea being that you can repopulate that reef, and over time, those corals are going to grow, and they're going to, you know, they're going to produce, you know, they're going to spawn and produce eggs and larvae, and, and those are going to fall down and produce more corals, and eventually that reef will kind of just build up. And so this is an approach that's being used uh, worldwide to try to repopulate reefs. Yeah, I actually saw a webinar about this this morning, but um, am I right that the success rate is not that great? That's right. So, you know, the, it's really difficult to know exactly where to plant um, these these outplants. You know, obviously that that reef degraded, the reef died. And so that told you that that was a hostile environment, mm -hmm. at least at one time and maybe still is. And so the survival rate for for these uh, corals that are planted back out into these degraded reefs, you know, it's it's variable on whether or not they're going to survive. And in some areas, they, they don't survive at all. Yeah, oftentimes they're actually grown in the lab where all the conditions are perfect, right? The water flow, the nutrients, everything the coral needs, it has. But then when you take that coral and put it out in real the real world, it doesn't do so well. Right? Right. Um, Yogi, I think we can use a little good news right now. Um, <laughs> what are uh, some ways we could improve the odds for uh, coral restoration and its success? Yeah, so uh, as yeah, it's it's a hard problem, and it's actually hard so there we know uh, a lot of these uh, interventions like to 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 help corals now it's easy to say yes we can do all that with robots right we can maybe have robots plant the corals and robots apply these antibiotics robots scrub off the algae uh, so but there are uh, so there are two problems right so one is um, so in uh, just a lot of these doing these tasks right uh, where we are there's a difference between observing, just making an observation with robots versus actually manipulating the environment. Is that, uh, it just adds a whole another level of complexity. Sure. So, but but I think we are making progress, and that, that's like a growing area of research. Uh, and uh, and and I think uh, we uh, with with uh, we are in our lab. We are trying to improve our capabilities of like robots operating close to the reef without harming them and be able to uh, and. In, in the future, hopefully, we add manipulation, which, which enable a whole bunch of these interventions, uh, allow us to kind of uh, uh, safely do them. Uh, so that's that's one part, like kind of doing well, these. Before you go on, how close are we to being able to do that? Because I mean, reefs are very fragile, right? And I'm just seeing this robot out there with its little clunky arm, like yeah. Right? So <laughs> yeah. So so the main challenge there is like most of the current underwater robots they use acoustics, so they've been kind of developed to use. Acoustic sensing because acoustic sensing can sense things very far away, and that's what they the main way they detect obstacles and go around. Uh, but what is needed for to operate close to coral reefs is, I mean, you need vision, you need computer vision. So that till now, I mean, not most of the robots you see being deployed in the ocean in the ocean, they don't use vision for as a way to to kind of navigate the environment. They, may, they might be collecting pictures, but they don't use it to navigate the environment. Because good for good reason, because the oceans are huge, you can't see very far. But in coral, that's that's like perfect place, right? You need that all that visual information. It's hard to kind of process, but if you do that, you are rewarded with this uh, capability of you can kind of perfectly lock onto a target and then, um, and then, uh, and then also use that to kind of uh, move the robot around. So that's another problem, right? So most of the robot, uh, you see, they all like are designed to stay flat and just you know collect data down, down, down. What really needed is these. We need robots which can move like you know uh, mm -hmm. like an acrobatically in the ocean, which uh, sounds cool, but it's really needed because the reefs are so geometrically so complicated. Like if you want to really observe uh, and manipulate things on its surface, you need to be able to operate in any arbitrary orientation and so which uh, which kind of all of a sudden that's where I actually machine learning is coming in and there's there's, uh, there's a lot of work happening in the terrestrial uh, mm -hmm. to control these complicated mm -hmm. terrestrial robots and we are trying to be looking at ways we can sort of use some of those techniques to uh, make our robots more controllable than these coral reefs. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Uh, so I wanted to say about the other thing of like there's another problem of like you know 
Yeah, we can plug, if you know you have plant the coral here, we can maybe a magical robot can do it. But then there's also a question of like, yeah, where should we plant the robot? Mm -hmm. And I think that- Plant the coral, yeah, plant the coral. Yeah, yeah. where should we <laughs> plant the coral? And uh, so the problem there is, you know, there are so many variables defining what a habitat might be, you know, everything from like Aaron Mooney's soundscape or, you know, or maybe the, uh, the Amy April who studies, like she looks at microbial signature, He's like that. mentioning effects. other researchers who are part uh, of the Reef Solutions yeah, Initiative. Sorry. Uh, everybody works on different things, has a uh, different area of yeah, specialization. Or, or uh, hydrodynamics, which another uh, member of our team is like Gordon is working on that. So there are the simply geometry, the substrate, and you know, there are so many variables which can define what, uh, which can influence where a coral might survive and kind of, I, I think the approach of, yeah, we'll, we'll plant all these corals here and see what happens and plant all these corals here. I mean, that's too late. I think we need to kind of change it so that we are always experimenting. We are always trying new locations and always incorporating that data into our model and always kind of trying out new locations. I think making it like a, uh, using AI to kind of continuously innovating and continuously trying new locations and also learning from learning from it but also right. kind of exploiting that knowledge like hey we know the, this coral works here kind of good so we'll we'll plant them here but we will still keep on you know testing new places out although it's good but you know maybe something the other place might be even better so right. like how do you kind of trade off this exploring new areas uh, or in exploiting what you have so that's like a traditional like very ai problem and uh, they use that in medicine a lot and i think we need to use that in corals Right. Are you working on any other kinds of uh, approaches, Colleen? Um, for in improving? For yeah, the, for improving the success of, of nurseries. Uh, yes. So one of the areas that um, we're, we're starting to work on right now is, you know, kind of bringing us back to the immune system again. You know, think about when um, when you start to feel sick, you know, what do you do? You you take a multivitamin or you take Zycam, you know, so you give yourself a little zinc boost. And so what you're doing there is you're giving yourself you know, these metal micronutrients that that boost your immune system and allow it to, to function in overdrive. And so we want to do that with coral. So we want to, to boost their immune system. And so we're currently working on some kind of smart materials, um, I, ways that we can make vitamin mixtures within um, these these tiles that we use to to grow baby corals that we use to outplant on, um, corals and uh, to to grow their immune system by giving them these metal micronutrients. That so they the need. physical tile that the coral would be planted on would actually be releasing nutrients that the coral needs. Exactly, oh, and so cool. we're we're coming up with that formulation. We want to know at what rate we need to release those micronutrients. How much is too much? You know, so we're really trying to figure out, and it's going to be very species specific, um, and it's going to be location specific. But that's that's the idea. We want to give them vitamins. <laughs> Neat. Neat. All right. So that that's a good example of just like he's looking at just one domain. It's so complicated just within that one space of how much you know this the, the zinc you give. And I imagine combining that with what soundscapes would be great exactly. and what, what uh, you know, microbial sort of background uh, environment would be And that's great. where artificial yeah, intelligence that, comes in and yeah, modeling so, to, to bring those all together. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. All right, um, I wanna pause again and see if we have any questions from our audience. It's really hard for me to see in here. I see a question over here, if we could uh, bring a microphone. Danielle, you're gonna have to help me out with actually spotting questions because okay. it's hard to see from here. Thank you. I'm wondering if it uh, if it's proving very difficult to uh, to bring back to restore the physical chemical environment for the corals, as they as they appear to be doing pretty well in, in estuaries. You know, oysters are back and being planted, and they're doing very well in New York Harbor and and in various areas. Is it is it possible to uh, start? And I know people get nervous about this, but um, to start to tweak the genetic composition of some of these species so that they become more tolerant to whatever the problem is, acidification, temperature, low oxygen, siltation, whatever you guys think is the problem in the environment. Yeah, that's it's a great question. And there are definitely groups that are working on whether or not you can evolve um, more resistant corals. You know, can you actually make kind of super corals? And um, and this is 
you know, been, I guess, being researched maybe for less than a decade, I would say. So it's, it's really early on. The tricky part is that corals grow slow, right? So, so you know, it's easy to evolve a microbe. They, they double on the order of, you know, a few hours, but, you know, a coral grows much slower. So it would be like trying to evolve us to be more resistant, you know, not quite that extreme, but, you know. Right, but I mean, so slow. a coral, like we're seeing a picture of some coral here, but so a, a relatively good sized coral, that could take hundreds of years to grow? Is yes, right? yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, the range is, is, is pretty large, um, but, you know, they, they grow about a centimeter or so a year, you know, so you're, you're talking about, um, it, it's hard to evolve uh, corals, but there are definitely groups that are, that are working on this. And I, I think, you know, right now at this point, we've got to kind of try everything we can, right? So we need to try lots of different approaches um, to see, you know, what, what will help, what will work. Yeah, I know. I know there are some experiments where they they break corals into lots of tiny pieces, and then they slowly increase the temperature and see which ones, which which uh, which, which ones are one able to individuals adapt. are surviving, yeah. right? And then they kind yeah, of yeah. Grow so there are different again. genotypes, so yeah. di different species, but they're just a little bit variable on the genetic level. And so yeah, like yeah. Yogi said that, you know, you, there's some great research that showed that if you fragment corals into little pieces, that they'll grow faster. And so you can actually speed up that growth and maybe speed up this evolution or look for mm -hmm. genetic variations that are naturally within the population and then propagate those, mm -hmm. right? And those so are like selective breeding in agriculture. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. 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 So I see we question. have a question from our online audience, Ken. Um, first, a comment of I think uh, something that uh, Colleen, you're building on something you were mentioning, that he points out that there are places such as Brazil where success rate for outplanting, you know, transplanting corals is quite high, but those, that's primarily in places where reefs have been destroyed by storms rather than degradation mm. of their, uh, their surroundings. Um, let's see, a couple of people have asked about use of the, of the algae as a, an intervention or restoration method? Is it possible to to uh, transplant the algae into the water in the hopes that they might be taken up by uh, by bleached corals? Yeah. So if a coral has bleached because of a marine heat wave, could you just put the algae back? Does that work? Yeah. I, you know, I don't know if anybody's um, really trying that. Yet. Um, I. I, you know, you would hope that the coral, the cor so these algae are already in the water, so it's not like the algae aren't there. It's allowing mm. that symbiosis to redevelop. So you yeah. have to yeah, do that? get them back into the coral tissue, allow that, that symbiosis or that relationship to reestablish. And that's not quite as easy as just introducing the algae to the water. Um, but there might be ways that you can try to, you know, negotiate <laughs> a little bit, yeah, say, uh, you know, come on, Coral. Um, and that may come down to some sort of, you know, intervention that can be done to kind of help reestablish that symbiosis. Yeah. Uh, Ken? Um, and then Emily asked, this is for Yogi, uh, could, a, could, a, could a robot or an AI system be developed stationed near a reef that would be able to detect, detect anomalies within the reef system and then go in and dispense the medicine where needed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that is in some ways uh, what we want to do, right? We don't want to just bombard the reef with medicine. If you can like <laughs> this, you know, if you can do this targeted application uh, of, of medicine, and uh, that's really, and um, we need robots which can detect anomalies and uh, confirm that they, they, that's what's, uh, uh, it's the right they can benefit yeah. from that, yeah. you know, the medicine, and then apply it. I know divers are currently we are using divers to do that, and. I think robots can definitely help in scaling that up. All right. Yep. I hope I haven't missed it, but what sort of data do you collect prior to selecting the locations for your applications? So that you're, how do you assess the environment and what the problems are in those environments before you start replanting or trans outplanting? A new word for me. That's a it's a great question. So I think um, you know typically when a reef starts to degrade, the the source of <clears throat> of the problem is usually somewhat known. Right? Is it rising temperature? Is it that there was a disease that came through? Is it a hurricane or um, coastal pollution? You know those kind of things. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, but whether or not that's going to be a chronic or an acute stress not isn't always as clear. Um, and and then and then on top of it, where do you plant it back out again? Because you're starting, you know, if you're if you're starting with a degraded reef and you're bringing out these small corals to to repopulate it. Um, it, it may not be as easy as oh well this was once a you know a um, healthy root healthy root thank yeah. you <laughs> that that can then repopulate it. it may need you may need to know where exactly to start as a nucleation site right so where do you actually where is the right circulation to bring nutrients where is the right like kind of refuge from some temperature um, anomaly you know so that you can start to get that hub and then start building that reef up. And reefs are so complex because it's not just the coral, right? It's also you need sponges there to, there are all these like large scale population interactions that are really difficult yeah, to, community. to think about in that replanting. AI. <laughs> <laughs> what about artificial reefs? Things like shipwrecks or actual custom designed, you know, uh, structures that are meant to mimic the, the architecture of a reef, like what we're seeing there. I think it's called a reef ball is that yeah so. this is an example of a reef ball um and they're little they're concrete um structures that are put in in the water um this is an example this was taken in the turks and caicos recently and these are about three years old three to four years old in terms of how long they've been in the water so not a lot of growth really not a lot of growth for three to four years so this is coming back to again this is a slow process um and and so you know the, these these artificial reefs are are serving some you know benefit already you know having these large structures in the water are is helping with erosion wave attenuation things like that but ultimately you need it to to grow and proliferate and become a reef and so artificial reefs in general haven't had a lot of success i mean variable success again everything you know it, it varies on the environment and some artificial reefs have taken off and then there's others that you know kind of sit um, and, and it takes a really long time to kind of establish that reef. So what kinds of things are there, is the Reef uh, Solutions Initiative team working on strategies to get coral to actually come and settle on that concrete structure? Yes, yeah, so, so some of the things Yogi uh, referred to earlier, so like soundscapes, inter, um, uh, the sounds that you heard when you came in earlier, uh, you know, providing uh, the right sounds. Uh, it's been shown that this can help actually recruit or bring in um, larvae, which are you know the small um, uh, the larvae that will come and settle on the, on the reef and then and then um, divide and then become a polyp and then you know ultimately become a coral. So you can provide so sounds. Um, uh, changing the hydrodynamics so you know these have these little holes in them and that provides some sort of refuge for for fish it also keeps the water flow around the reef structure reef structure that reef structure <laughs> so the the nutrients and uh, are are coming up to the surface where the corals are growing other things are are introducing uh, probiotics so just like um, with trying to have a healthy gut right so provide a healthy microbiome that will help bring in corals and then give them a head start in terms of acquiring those essential symbionts to to grow and then lastly you know some of the work that i had talked about earlier that we're thinking about in terms of outplants and nurseries we also want to start thinking about more bio inspired materials so if you can think about not just putting out concrete what if you actually had uh, nutrient infused materials what if you had materials that were actually going to provide a benefit to the coral not just be a physical presence but actually provide an ability for that coral to build its immunity to build its resilience so those are some of you know and again it's bringing all these things together which i know yogi will bring up <laughs> what are you going to say yogi yeah. <laughs> so yeah, because it's a lot to try to figure out how to optimize that that environment. Yeah, I mean, a lot to optimize, lots of confounding variables, and uh, and um, yeah, a lot to experiment with. But but also just like I, I think the I think robots could also help with the actual process of like you know putting these things together like at yeah. the moment, right? So uh, maybe. Uh, and once you have put them together, um, uh, uh, kind of keeping an eye on them, are they 
early, the same thing as how you are diagnosing like a, a reef, you want to sort of keep an eye on what you have done and like be mm -hmm. able to react uh, as needed. So like, you know, um, so building them at scale and like, uh, and keeping an eye on them, I think uh, well, that's good. Yeah, and make uh, modifications as necessary, yeah, right? Yeah, so if yeah. we're watching them in yeah, real so, time. Yeah, so it's not just like dump it. Throw them out there. Throw them out there, like, but yeah. just interact with it, like, you know, so and, uh, fix it as needed. Right. Yeah, so one of the things I find really cool about the Reef Solutions Initiative and actually all of HUI um, is that uh, you have all these interactions between people in different fields. So right now you're watching an engineer and a biogeochemist talk to each other, but within the Reef Solutions <laughs> Initiative, there's also... Uh, you know, people who work on microbiology and acoustics and uh, the physical flow within the ocean. And all of those factors are really important um, to bring together using Yogi's AI to, um, to really figure out what's going on on a complicated place like a, like a reef. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Any more questions? I see a hand in the back there. Thank you. So it's so encouraging. There are so many different ways in which I think it's clear that we're starting to figure out what works, right? What actually can make a difference. But I see a problem of scale, right? We've lost 50% of the world's coral reefs in the last 30 years. And, and, and so many of these activities are, are in their nascent stages, right? Where we're just we're still figuring out, okay, oh, this is encouraging. If we do this, if we tweak this, it, it makes a little bit of a difference. But, and this is a question for both of you, really, you know, on the robotic side, but also on the science side, and also on the kind of the side of engaging with communities that live with and depend on, on coral <coughs> reefs. What do you see as the keys to scaling solutions to this really, truly massive crisis? Sam, you're stealing my next question, but I'll, I'll forgive you. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you want to start? No, you can do that. Yeah. Um, do I, yeah, I, yeah. Go ahead. I think you should start. All right. yeah. I got to think. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, scaling is um, an interesting challenge. So what does it mean to scale, right? So we, there are so many coral reefs everywhere around the world, and I, and I think the what is needed is, uh, yes, we, we don't need like this magical million dollar robot which can you know, do everything uh, and, like perfectly, but we can only put it at one location in the world, right? Well, what we need is a thousand, thousand dollar robots uh, which, can, uh, which can be given out to everybody who needs them, right? So, and uh, to diagnose their reads early on or to intervene early on and like a tiny, uh, robust sort of uh, robots that easily you don't need to, you don't need an engineer to deploy them anybody can deploy them uh, and and I think what that means is there's uh, we need to develop technologies which are kind of more, uh, less complicated in terms of the hardware and the sensors and more in terms of like you know more general purpose sensors more AI more machine learning so so because copying machine learning to is like, you know, just copying uh, a program over there. So easy to scale uh, and less, more you rely on software, less you rely on hardware, easier to, to scale. And, and I think looking at ways we can sort of do that uh, will rely more on intelligence uh, rather than specialized uh, expensive uh, devices to more we can sort of scale this up. Um, yeah, I'll add on to that with yeah with being able to have um, so so disco is an example you know disco we can't put disco into everybody's hands and and that's one diver in one location at one point in time uh, you know so what we're trying to do is we're trying to take that technology we're trying to take those ideas and we're trying to miniaturize it we're trying to shrink it down and we're trying to make it low cost so that you can actually make small deployable sensors that can be placed on reefs globally and then sending us that data back, which is going to be a gigantic data stream, which then comes back to this machine learning and and how do we like, you know, be able to to look for these process warning signs and, and process and, and, and yeah. analyze. Yeah. 
But I just want to, you know, to the community engagement aspect, you know, I also think that not only do we need robots and we need deployable sensors, but we also need to bring in the community. So if you think about, you know, how many people are, are certified to dive or snorkel or even just swim in, in coastlines and, and waters and, and go out to coral reefs daily, all the time, all over the world. So we really need to start using people as our platform, including you, know, you in the audience. Um, and so what, what we want to ultimately do is take some of these sensors that we're developing and we want to integrate them into, say, dive watches or integrate it into your BC or some way that we can make you the sensing platform. And then we're starting or well, we're just starting now a new collaboration that we're, we're um, initiating with PADI, which is you know, the Professional Association of Diving Instructors. Um, so they have uh, an outreach component, an education component called PADI Aware. And so we're starting to this collaboration with them to say, look, if we if we can build this sensing platform that can be put on divers and snorkelers and swimmers, will you help us disseminate it around the world through dive shops everywhere where we can get divers in the water and helping us solve this problem? And I think that's where we really need yeah, to go. Really exciting because there's people diving and swimming everywhere, all over the world, all the time, and and that would be where where I think our future is. And it would also engage the community into to helping make a difference, right? And also bring in nonprofit organizations and um, to, to yeah, also be Yeah, you could put it in the of hands this. of fishermen in coral reef nations, right? Who yeah. depend on these reefs for their day-to-day -day livelihood, but you could have them also helping to gather the data. Exactly, yeah. yep. Yeah. yeah, and then that's like an example of, we can do this now, right? We do, like, right. we can, uh, uh, there's a way to scale things up right now. Mm -hmm. right, so that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Ken, any online questions? Let's see. Um. I see we've got one in the room. So why don't we yeah, go to that there, first, I'll and then I'll come back to you. I okay. see that aquaculture is expanding worldwide. Aquaculture? Do you feel as though this has a positive or negative effect on coral reefs, the end products? Because it doesn't look like they're doing everything the way it should be done. It seems like they're using artificial means to increase their production. Is this having a detrimental effect on the coral reefs or has it been studied? I can attempt. So I so there's been uh, recently there's been a shift in there's been a growing sort of shift in like how we do aquaculture. Like so earlier, all the aquaculture was like close shore, you know, giant tanks or lots of polluting to uh, pollution happening and going into maybe these reefs and all those things. But I think there's a slow move to, but there's, uh, people also found that that you grew fish and they will get diseases all the time and their whole farm will pick up some disease and were very complicated and very bad. So, but recently there has been a move to have more offshore aquaculture farms, which like kind of putting this farm in the uh, like a, maybe a, open you know, ocean. lots yeah. of in the middle of the ocean where there's lots of flow and uh, and uh, there uh, so they in in some ways like you grow much healthier fish it, all of the, or they you can place them where there are no coral reefs so it's easy to sort of prevent them um, from kind of directly affecting but then the the challenge there though is like harder to manage them, right? So that's where actually a lot of the, uh, there's robots and uh, automated sort of sensing and uh, platform technologies are, people have been using a lot of them to sort of manage these uh, farms because it can probably, it's kind of, it can be very dangerous and complicated to kind of go send a person there all the time. So, so I think we need, robots have been sort of enabling. Uh, that's right, we have that, people here at Huey working more on kelp aquaculture and um, I know robots are part of that picture yeah. as well to monitor them and yeah. you know, make sure everything's going well, but yeah. um, those don't actually require any inputs. They just grow naturally in the, in the water without fertilizer or, or anything like that. So, uh, yes, Ken. Um, so, Alan points out, you know, a key aspect of determining or of uh, addressing the causes of reef decline is often how quickly information get, can get back to uh, people and the, the local stakeholders 
who may also be affecting the reef on a local basis. So what kinds of techniques are being used to get actionable information uh, to people and communities, particularly those with limited resources and in far flung places of, of the oceans? Yeah, and that's a, that's a great question. I think, you know, there's a, I think the primary way right now is a lot of nonprofit organizations that are in, you know, small local communities um, that are trying to help, um, at least in the work that we've been doing in the Virgin Islands, uh, US Virgin Islands, there's a nonprofit kind of ocean stewards community that that these are all kind of um, volunteers that go out and are, are assessing reefs all the time and, and dive, you know, pr pretty much daily to, to go out and look at how the reefs are doing. Um, Beyond that, I know there's, you know, interest in developing kind of satellite kind of um, based imaging that can look at more remote locations. But there again, you're going to you're going to wait until the reef is white, right? Or you're showing some massive change in the reef architecture. Um, that's only going to tell you that something's wrong when, you know, when it's such an extreme change that you see it. I see Ken's hand up. Ken, go ahead. <laughs> um, several people have been asking this quite a bit uh, on the on, on Zoom, and we've gotten well over a hundred questions running there. Um, but I'll use Steve's as a template for us. Uh, he says, you know, it, it seems that replanting reefs require, requires a great deal of logistics and people with a certain degree of skill. What are little things that people can do? provide a difference for coral reefs and, and I would add especially you know people who maybe don't live near a shoreline or who have never been to a, a reef. Well, I mean, I can take a stab at that myself, right? <laughs> uh, you know, it's all the basic things you think of, right? I mean, a lot of this is linked to climate change, obviously. So there's all the things one could do to help alleviate climate change. Um, I know that as far as people who do go to reefs, there's certain kind of sunscreens that are bad for reefs, right? So don't use those sunscreens. Um, all these little things, plastics, obviously, we don't really know what they're doing on, on reefs at this point, but the more you reduce your plastic use, the better. You know, all of those kind of broad sweeping things can, can come into play for coral reefs, just like every other ocean ecosystem. Did you want to add something? Yeah, and I was just going to say that, you know, education is key, right, to educate people about, you know, how they can do little things to make a difference. And, um, and there are also um, some nonprofits that are kind of popping up that are training, you know, the communities. If, if, you, if you do go um, uh, to a reef or you live in a, in a location where you have access to a reef, there are nonprofits that are, are starting to work with the community say, hey, we're going to train you on how to go out and, and, and um, put these out plants out. So to help plant um, baby corals out, um, there's, there's a number of different uh, communities or, or groups that are trying to and train again the community again to help with this replantation um, um, and repopulation of reefs. So there's you know that kind of aspect as well as again you know yeah one person can't can't do a whole reef but if if we all work together um we can start you know making a difference in trying to outplant these these corals for that for that one approach Jeremy. all right so i think we need to end it there as far as the questions go um but please do stay with us, online audience, because we have, uh, in just a second here, we're going to show a film that we're really excited to share with you about the Reef Solutions Initiative. So stay tuned for that. Uh, first, I want to say a very big thank you to Colleen Hansel and Yogi Gerdha for joining us tonight to share what they're doing in their work on coral reefs um, with all of us here tonight. So let's give them a big hand. And as always, a very big thank you to all my Kui colleagues who are working so hard behind the scenes to make these events possible. Uh, this one in particular, I know, was a big technical challenge to be both online and in person simultaneously. So let's give all of them a big hand as well.
And to everyone who joined us here in Woods Hole and online, whether you're on Zoom or Facebook or YouTube, thank you very much. Um, if you enjoy our Ocean Encounters programs, you can be part of HUI's solution-based approach to ocean science. Please consider becoming a HUI member. I think almost everyone in the room here is a HUI member already, but if you're listening online, um, you'll be giving crucial support to our outreach efforts like this one, to our education programs, to our engineers and our scientists. Um, and in celebration of World Ocean Day, as was mentioned earlier, a group of generous supporters has come together to actually do a triple match for us today. Um, and so any gift received today will be met by this triple match, which is really terrific. Um, so please do join us. Before we close tonight with that film I just mentioned, we have another brief video message. This one is from a Hui scientist named Amy April. Amy is the head of the Reef Solutions Initiative. She couldn't be with us here tonight because uh, she's actually off doing research on coral reefs in the Cayman Islands right now. So let's hear from Amy. Hello everyone, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with you tonight. I'm here on beautiful Little Cayman, studying the microbial associates of the corals here, which are actually really special. These corals have managed to avoid getting the stony coral tissue loss disease that's plaguing most of the Northern Caribbean. As you've heard tonight, coral reefs are indeed in crisis worldwide, but with scientific advances and new technology, there's still time to turn things around. Yogi, Colleen and all of the Reef Solutions team are already taking action on a plan that can halt and even reverse the coral reef crisis. But to really work, we need your help. We need to be able to take our prototype technologies and our pilot projects and scale them up. And we need to show the world that what we can do will work and that will work on a global scale. So now I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy our new film, Hope for Corals in Crisis, which takes you on a behind the scenes look at the development of our approaches and new technology. With your help, we can truly give reefs the chance that they deserve. Thanks for watching. As soon as I splash down on a healthy coral reef, it's like a bustling little city. I'm immediately drawn to the activity, what's moving. Fish of various sizes and colors. You can focus in on one specific area and you'll just see it teeming with life. Snapping shrimp snapping and the parrotfish chirping and the damselfish whistling to each other. There's no other place in the natural world where you get bombarded with so many colors, shapes, textures, it's just, uh, it's just like a party going on there all the time. Coming down on an unhealthy reef is just such a different experience. Not only do you miss those colors, but you miss that three-dimensional structure. They are just like so bland compared to when you see a healthy reef. It looks like something died there. And basically, it's the ecosystem has died there. Reefs are incredibly complex and therefore they require a multidisciplinary team. So we have experts in chemistry, microbiology, acoustics, and robotics that are helping us innovate the, the solutions that we need to help save these coral reefs. I'm a microbial ecologist, so I specialize in the smallest organisms in the ocean, the microbes. Our lab looks at the microbes from both uh, healthy, how are they helping, but also we're taking that critical view of them as uh, pathogens and trying to understand who's involved in some of those um, diseases.
Basically what we do is we send a diver down with a set of syringes and they're hovering above the coral and, and taking a water sample. Those samples get processed on the boat and then that comes back to my lab here at the Woods Hole Oceanographic where we have all the equipment we need to be able to extract the DNA and sequence that DNA and understand what microbes are there, what kinds of genes they have. Do we actually see a unique signature coming off the, that coral? And does it change with health state of the coral? Mm -hmm. with that one too. I kind of think of myself as a sensory biologist. I like to get the, the animal's perspective of the world around it. And a lot of my background or my work is focused on listening, hearing, sound in the sea. The there you go. The first way we started thinking about this is just listening to the reefs in general and putting out these sort of sound recording microphones called hydrophones. And we set it to record for usually one minute every 10 minutes. And that allows us to get essentially the patterns of what's happening on our reef. We kind of set up these frames, essentially these anchors. They're just rebar stakes. We affix the listening structure to that rebar stake and then we can leave it there for a month at a time. What we're really listening for or assessing on reefs is the fish sound. So we think that's really, really important. You can begin to kind of then listen for changes in your reefs. And you can tell that disease is coming or the warming is happening or there's a, a change essentially in the animal patterns and their calling rates on that reef. And when that disease hits, we can A, notice a very audible difference in those reefs, particularly that coral hub, that pillar coral where it's a lot quieter out. And it kind of shows you that you're beginning to kind of lose that community center of the reef. And losing those is going to be really detrimental to the reef. We're finding that healthy reefs have a particular sound and that can increase coral settlement on those reefs. So that begs the question, can we play sounds and, and bring larvae back to that reef? And that's where we're going now. And so that's, that's a really intriguing finding that we can begin to kind of rebuild that reef. The expertise that I bring is that I study the chemistry of, of organismal health. So what, what are the chemicals that control the organism's immune system? And then how can we boost that immunity to help organisms survive? These are the same chemicals that our bodies use to fight off colds or when we get infected with a pathogen. And the same chemicals are being produced by corals, but they're really hard to measure because they live for about 30 seconds within the ocean. So what we need to be able to do is develop sensors to go in and measure it within the reef, which is what we've been working on for about the last five years. Our hope and goal is to make this autonomous. So what we want to do is miniaturize it, bring it down to the size of a button. And what we want to be able to do is make these deployable where we can stick them out right at the surfaces of various corals in, within a reef and then have that information sent to us via satellite in real time. As a roboticist and a computer scientist, a coral reef ecosystem this is a very interesting space for a robot to work in and try to understand what's happening. And, and so uh, what I hope to do is make our robots understand the coral reef ecosystems and then use that understanding to make decisions. What are you it looks like a tangled two, three track lines and we can do a lot more after that. We have a bunch of robots and like different students leading each experiment. There's a student who's working on the following animals around. And there's another student working on how species are distributed. Another student is working on like how to teach robots what to pay attention to. The chance of you doing state-of-the-art stuff is much more when you have students on the project. The ultimate goal is to have a, a team of autonomous robots, easily deployable, widely available, monitoring coral reefs and to be able to detect something going bad early so that we can do something about it. It's only recently that we have made this progress in machine learning and AI techniques that we have a chance to fully make a difference. If coral reefs are going to survive, they need people, they need science, and they need technology. They need people to understand the problems, they need scientists to develop the solutions, 
and they need technology to scale up the solutions to reach all reefs worldwide. What we want to be able to do is find early stage indicators of stress. Detect the signs of stress to a coral before we visually see them. Uh, the ultimate goal is to be able to diagnose a coral reef early on, early on enough that we could do some intervention to fix it. What we want to see is solutions that, that we can actually apply to the reef. So that is the ultimate success that we're looking for, is developing new solutions and making them scalable. Being able to communicate what we're doing and tell the story of the reefs is also going to be an important part of our success. It would be a big problem if we lost reefs without telling people the story that there's still time. That's also a really important part of what we're trying to do is just raise more awareness about the current situation with reefs and what people can do to help and how we are really working towards solutions.